Nie na nie. Okay, take your Bible with me this morning and open to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We have been going through the book of Galatians. And about a month ago, we left off in Galatians chapter 2. We got down through verse 19. And you say, well, and I, 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 I wanted to correct and make sure everybody understands exactly what your pastor's doing. Back in 2019, I had got two verses in my head, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Uh, where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, and Christ is dead in vain. And my intentions, when I went to those two passages in early 2019, I think it was March of 2019, I was going to preach one message, and I ended up preaching eight messages. And I ended up going down through Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. And I had a, a, a dear brother in Christ that's been listening to our series. He contacted me this week, and he said, when are you going back to Galatians? You've been out of Galatians for a while. When are you going back? I said, I'm going back this Sunday. I said, I'm picking up Galatians 3.15. He said, why are you skipping? And I said, I preached on it less than two and a half years ago. They're out there. And he, he said, oh, yeah, I remember. I, I've already listened to them. So if you, if, if, it's not that I am skipping over something, but I'm not going through and preaching those same eight messages again to get back to here. But my intentions from this point forward is to begin here in chapter 3, verse 15, and continue verse by verse and go through the remainder of this book. I, I know when I started this thing in Galatians 2, I made it down to verse 14, and I just ran empty. But I'm, I, I think that I can go on through this time, and we'll stick with this book until we finish the complete chapter. So I just want to give you that as an explanation so you'll know what's going on. And if you, you want to go back and you want to listen to the messages that get you from chapter uh, 2 to here where we're at, uh, they're there for you to listen to. I've entitled this message this morning, The Covenant of Grace. The Covenant of Grace, this will be part one. I, when I started uh, this week, I, I thought it would be a one-parter, but I think it's going to be a multiple-parter. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as his apostles, they were always clear on this matter of justification. They didn't leave it up for our subjective understanding, but they were very clear that justification... That is to say, our being declared legally righteous before God. That's how God views his people. Righteous, holy, accepted. He views you and me, sinners, by birth, by nature, by practice, by choices. We're found in the Lord Jesus Christ, clothed in, robed in, wrapped in his righteousness. He sees us holy, now get this, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You say, oh, preacher, you don't know me. Oh, yeah, I know you because I know me. But I don't even know myself as I should. But I know this much, I know I'm a sinner. And if you're honest, you know you're a sinner. And if you're honest, even more honest, you know this. God will accept nothing less than perfection. See, that's, that's what religion doesn't tell you. They say, give it your best shot. Try hard. Keep the law. Be good to your neighbor. Be kind to your friend. Try to love God. Listen, the scriptures know nothing of try. They say do. The law doesn't say give it your best attempt. The law says you must keep the law in every jot and every tittle from the cradle to the grave. And somehow, and I don't know how men and women can, can miss this, this vital issue, somehow you've got to be able to make that, uh, that legal obedience that you perform infinite in value. Now you tell me how you're going to do that. How are you going to make your obedience stretch from eternity past to eternity future? That's why we need an everlasting righteousness. And that's what our Lord Jesus Christ brought in. And so they were clear that justification was by grace alone, in Christ alone, 
And we must be very clear on this. As opposed to salvation by works of the law or obedience of the flesh. When our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, He declared the difference and He declared the superiority of the everlasting covenant of grace over that old mosaic economy. He said, for this is my blood of the New Testament, the New Covenant, the New Promise, which is shed for many. For what? For the remission of sin, the putting away of sin. As a sinner, isn't that what you want to know? Don't you want to know this morning my sins have been dealt with? Is there any better news for a sinner? That, is there any better news to me this morning to consider the words of King David when he said in, in Psalm 32, Blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is he whose iniquities are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord God will not charge sin. Somebody out there God ain't charging sin to. That's where I want to be. How about you? David, Paul, when he restated David's words in Romans chapter 4, he even went further. He said, blessed is he whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord, listen to this, imputeth righteousness. Hold on. Without works. <laughs> oh, my. You say, well, there you go. I can do what I want to do. I tell you, if that's your attitude, you don't know this God. Before our Lord's birth, we read it just a moment ago, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist being filled with the Holy Ghost, he prophesied of Christ's work as the promised Messiah. The apostle Peter declared the same message when he preached the gospel in the temple. On the day of Pentecost, he said, you are the children of the prophets. And listen to this, and of the covenant. Not, listen, not all of them. There were more than 3,000 standing there the day that, see, I, I, that's the thing we miss. There were more than 3,000 people gathered there when Peter preached. That didn't mean every, everybody that, sat, that stood there in front of Peter or sat there in front of Peter. Not the whole group was converted. There were 3,000 souls brought to know the Lord out of that mass of humanity. And that's who he's talking to. He's saying to you, the ones, who, the ones who were ordained to eternal life, the ones who God had purposed to save, the ones for whom Christ had died, the ones for whom this covenant was established. He said, you are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed. And we're going to get there this morning. In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. The apostle Paul, moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote words to those at Corinth that clearly stated the profound difference between the grace of God and the promised seed in the works of the law. Listen to you. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. Who also hath made us able ministers of the new covenant, the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, for the letter, what's that? That's the law of Moses in its entirety. The letter what does it do? It kills. Why? The wages of sin, death. But the Spirit. Remember Paul said in Romans chapter 8, the law for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from this same law that he says is the letter of the law of sin and death. He says the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones, which that's the ten, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. 
which glory was, listen, was to be done away. How, much, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which, was, which is done away, he's speaking of it in, it's already occurred. This is after Christ cried, it's finished, and the temple was rent in two. The veil in the temple was rent in twain. He says that for if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now again, we come back to these believers at Galatia. And many of these at Galatia, they were, they were now in danger, and they were. They were in danger of following this heresy of the Judaizers. That the works of the law are just as essential. Now get this. The works of the law are just as essential, if not more essential, than the accomplished work of Christ. According to what Paul wrote in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, Galatians, if they followed that path to the end, if they continued, where was it going to end up? It proved themselves to be unbelievers. How do we know that? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. For I testify again to everyone that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. You're going to go under the law, you've got to get under all of it. I've made this statement before, I'll continue to make it as long as I have got breath in my lungs. The scriptures do not distinguish between the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and the ceremonial law, or anything involved in that old law. It is the law of Moses. It is a system. It was a covenant of work for national Israel. Is that clear enough? And he says this, if you're going to get under that law, and this applies to you and me, if you think that, that your obedience to the law makes a difference between life and death, don't just get under the ten. You better get, you better, somehow you better find you a son of Levi. And somehow you better set you up a temple. And you better go to offering morning sacrifices and evening sacrifices. You need to follow all of You need to watch what you wear. You need to watch what you eat. You need to watch the way you walk. You need to be careful that you don't kill anybody by accident. God help you if you do because there ain't no city's refuge. That's bad English. There's no city's refuge out there for you to flee to. It's the whole system. That was what was required. He says, Christ, listen to this. This is how important it is. Christ has become of no effect to you. It's worthless. Whosoever you justified by the law. And then the na death nail. You have fallen from grace. Didn't mean they lost their salvation. He's just saying what? You have departed from the only way by which God brings his people to true faith and true repentance. And having dog doctrinally and dogmatically proved in these chapters up to where we're beginning at this morning in verse 15 that redemption and justification are through and by Christ alone, based on his righteous obedience unto death without the works of the law. The Apostle Paul now proceeds in these verses we're going to start looking at this morning to prove, and I, I, this is, I'm so thankful for this, to prove the immutability, the unchangeableness of God's will and his promise in this matter of salvation. By grace alone, through Christ alone, without the works of the law. I just keep hitting that, but that's it, without the works of the law. Notice what he says, brethren. This is verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of man. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, 
no man disannulleth, and no man addeth thereto. That's a strange way to write. But listen, this is a man moved by the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit used him. You know, our, our God sometimes expresses himself to us in terms that you and I can understand. I think that the actual term for it is anthropomorphism, I think. I think that it's a big word, but that, it means that, you know, it talks about God having hands and feet and eyes and ears. The eyes of the Lord are in all places. Be old and good. And our God doesn't have eyes. He's not, he's, he's, he's not a man. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is a man, but the true and living God, what? He doesn't have hands and feet and eyes and ears and and. and, and, and Sinful passions and guidance like we have. And so Paul proceeds here to use something that you and I can relate to to try to bring home how important it is that we make the distinction that justification is by grace alone. And so he brings up a man's covenant. But what I find interesting about this is the way he starts this off. He calls them brethren. Brethren. Yet he referred to these same people back at the beginning of this chapter. At verse 1, he called them, Oh, foolish Galatians. <laughs> oh, for Galatians 3, 1, Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And yet here he turns around, what does he call them? Brethren. Is he confused? No, because think about it. This word, brethren, in the original... It means a brother, whether born of the same two parents or born of the same mother or the same father. But there's a secondary meaning of the word, and I think that's the one that Paul used here. It means a fellow believer, one united to one another by the bond of affection found in Christ. In other words, when Paul addresses these who he'd call foolish Galatians before he addresses them brethren, his hope and his thoughts is, you know what it is? His hopes and his thoughts concerning them, these that he's writing to at this time, is that they were indeed fellow believers who had succumbed to this heretical teaching that the Judaizers were promoting. If you recall, the apostle Peter, by his actions, and because of the fear of man, what's he done? Back in chapter 2, he actually gave credence to what these fools were teaching. And Paul had to withstand him for it. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew himself and separated himself. And here's the fear of man's a, tr a snare, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw, listen to this, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the man of the Gentiles is not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews do? You know, Paul didn't write Peter off. He didn't cast him aside. And let, Peter had great... You talk, talk about, This is a grievous error. Peter has done something that he never preached or believed. Peter, like Paul, believed salvation by grace alone in Christ alone based on his righteousness alone. And yet by his actions, he denies that. Yet Peter didn't write him, Paul didn't write him off. What did he do? He sought his recovery. How did he seek his recovery? In love, he withstood him to his face. And in similar fashion, Paul sought here the recovery of these who he considered to be his brethren, fellow believer, by clearly proclaiming the doctrinal truths concerning Christ, his blood. How do you recover, sinner? Well, we're going to set up a disciplinary committee. And we're going to put you out of the church. We're going to deal harshly with you. Now, it's not the wrath of God that leads to repentance. What leads to repentance? It's the goodness of God. It's His mercy. It's His grace. And I, that's a lesson I need to learn. 
And I need to put into practice in dealing with those men and women that I know and love and have at times been uh, referred to me as brother and sister in Christ. And I've referred to them as brethren in the Lord Jesus Christ in my dealing with them when they err. And it should be the same in the way that you deal with me if I err. Brethren, if a, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself. Because what are we all prone to do? You think Peter ever thought he had ever done that? Huh? No more than he thought that he'd ever deny our Lord Jesus Christ three times. Remember, our Lord, he, 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 he said, I, you know, when everybody else is gone, who's going to be there with you? I'm going to be there. And our Lord looked at him and told him what? Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. I love the way he begins his defense of the truth. By making a physical comparison that all men and women, you and me included, can readily admit and agree to when it comes to a will or a testament. Listen to a little translation of this verse. Brethren, as a man, I say it, even of a man, a confirmed covenant, no man, no one doth make void or doth add to that covenant. That's Young's literal translation. What's Paul talking about here when he makes this statement? He's talking about a, a, a will. That's what he's talking about. Matter of fact, the word translated covenant, here's what it means. It means a disposition, arrangement of any sort which one wishes to be valid. The last disposition which one makes of his earthly possessions and their distribution after his death. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a last will and testament. And he says here that it's, what is it? It's a binding agreement. It's a binding agreement. And, and like most of you, I, if you live in the state of Louisiana, I, I didn't learn this until my daddy had passed away. We had always been after my daddy. Daddy, you need to, you need to make a will. Daddy had a, a pretty good property and things like that and we kept telling me and my brother kept telling my daddy daddy need to make a will need to make a will daddy i am i am i am i am we'll come to the end of the time daddy dies don't make a will first thing that lawyer told us when we sat down he said if you don't have a will in the state of louisiana what does the state of louisiana do for you they make a will for you and the will in the state of louisiana is what it's 50-50 among the remaining heirs. It's equal distribution among the heirs. But if you make a will, how things go? According to the will, right? And the lawyer that I taught with told me, he said, it don't, he don't have to go sit down with a lawyer. Just, and I tried to get Daddy to do that. I carried a piece of paper in there. I said, Daddy, write down the way you want things done and sign it and date it, because that's what that lawyer told me. And he said, if it's in his handwriting and it's dated and he's in his right mind when he wrote it, it's legally binding, as if he sat down with a lawyer and wrote it up. And Daddy, I, okay, but he never did. Never did. But if he had, had he done so, what would happen? But I told my Daddy, Daddy kept telling me, well, I don't know how I want things to be divided up. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt your feelings or your little brother, your big brother's feelings. I told him, I said, Daddy, you write down what you want because it's your will and testament. I said, if you want to give him everything, give him everything, but put it in writing and we'll honor it. Matter of fact, it wouldn't have been that I wanted to honor it. I'd be legally obligated to honor it. So Paul's point by these words that he uses here is that if men, as if men, we can agree that a will or a testament, no man can disannul it. Or no man can add to it. Anything. You don't, you don't, you don't change the game in the middle of the game. How much more when it comes to the will of God, the covenant of grace? like what Mr. Gill wrote on this verse. He said, If a covenant made between men 
or a man's will and testament be confirmed, signed, sealed, and witnessed in a proper manner. No other man can make them void or take anything from them or add anything to them. Only the parties concerned by the will and according to their consent. And if this be the case among men, much less with the covenant of God. Much less can the covenant of God confirm by two immutable things. What? His covenant and his oath. Or any branch of it be disannulled. Or be capable of receiving any addition thereunto. Because what's he about to talk about? He's about to talk about the law. The law came how long after the covenant of grace? 430 years. Actually, eternity. But that covenant that he made with Abraham, 430 years from then is when law came. And he said... That law that came after the covenant does not disannul and it does not change the covenant. The covenant is what? In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed without any regard to the law coming after. He goes on, he says, the apostle seems to have a particular respect to that branch of the covenant and will of God which regards the justification of his people in God's sight based exclusively on the righteousness of Christ to which the false teachers were adding the works of the law. These false teachers, folks, they had subtly changed the covenant of God. Adding things into the covenant of grace, that covenant of grace that had been ratified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and satisfied by his obedience unto death. They were seeking to put God's redeemed back under the law. And Paul would have no part of it. Justification, salvation, is by grace alone, through Christ alone, not based on anything done by or worked out through the sinner obedience, their sincerity, or their morality. Memorize this verse a long time ago, and it's important. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How did he save us? By mercy. Through the washing of regeneration. That's the new birth. And renewing of the Holy Spirit. What's that? That's conversion. That's Christ in you. The hope of glory. Through which he has shed a blood on shed, shed abundantly, shed on us abundantly. How? Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Listen, to, this is the covenant of grace. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So that brings us to this declaration that he makes. Verse 16. Concerning the justification of God's elect. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed which is Christ. Now, I know people try to make things a whole lot more complicated. Now, that's pretty simplistic language there. It doesn't take a whole lot to understand that. But I, I want to show you two things real quick, and I'll quit. First of all, by his words here, we need to determine what these promises are. Because he tells us clearly here, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So that's the question. What, what's the promises? Well, I know this much. The promises here, this word translated promise, it means an announcement. Or it means a, a promised good or blessing. A promised good or blessing. So, the promises which Paul speaks of here refer to the promises that are spoken of. Look at verse 17 real quick. This I say, that the covenant, 
which was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the, there's the promise. The law doesn't make the promise of none effect. It's always been by grace. Peter spoke of that promise. And Paul told the believers at Corinth about that promise. He says, For the Son of God, which was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God are in him. Yea, that's yes. And in him, amen, so be it. And since it's in him, what is it? It's unto the glory of God. These promises include the promises. Think about it. Here, let me give you real quick. Let me give you this. Because this, to me, this is, this is our encouragement. This is our hope. Here's the, what's included in this promise. The promise that he'll be our God and we'll be his people. Listen to you. But this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. That ain't got nothing to do with Israel over yonder. That's the Israel of God. Go read Galatians chapter 6. Who's a Jew? Not one is a Jew outwardly. Not, not somebody's got the name Rubenstein or Obramowitz or something like that. He's a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is not outward in the flesh. What it, it's in the heart. Here's what else is included in those promises. The promise that Christ will be our Redeemer and our Savior, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life in immortality to light. How did he do it? Through the gospel. Here's another. The promise of the Holy Spirit that he'll be our sanctifier. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The promise that we receive justification, Christ's righteousness, pardoned by his blood, adoption into his family being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. The promise of perseverance in the faith. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. And to present you to himself. Holy. Unblameable. And unreprovable in his sight. To the only wise God our Savior be glory. And majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. And last of all, the promise of eternal inheritance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to those at Ephesus. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual. How many all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. According as he hath chosen us in him. Before the foundation of the world. Peter put it like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, 
fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Thank God for these who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. But this is what's so important about this. All these promises are where? All the promises of God are in Him. You hear that? In Him. Yea. And amen. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. But here's the, here's the second thing, and I'll quit with this. We have to determine from Paul's word, who's these promises for? Who's, who, who are they to? Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, and to seeds, saith not, and to seeds as a many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now this is so important. All these promises that I just quote, read the scriptures to you concerning were made to and they were secured for Abraham and his seed. All of them. And here's the question you need to ask yourself. What was the promise that God originally made to Abraham? Because I know this much. Whatever that promise was, Abraham believed it. It's then found in Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 through 6. And the promise was this. He carried him out and told him, he said, you look now to the skies. And if you can number the stars in heaven or you can pick up and count and number the sand of the seashore, so shall thy seed be. And then he told him this. He said, in your seed, S-E-E-D, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Those natural-born Jews were basically a curse to every, every group of people that ever lived on the planet. Do you realize that? Because of national Israel, the Amorites and the Amalekites and the Philistines and the Moabites, all of them, what happened to them? They got utterly destroyed. Now, how could he make that in your seed? That's not a blessing if Pharaoh and his army goes into a sea and gets closed up and drowned. That's not a blessing. That's a curse. How could he make that promise? It didn't have nothing to do with them. It had everything to do with the S-E-E-D seed. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he said of Abraham, your father, remember the Jews said, said We're, we have one father, even Abraham. He said, if Abraham your father, you'd believe me. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And he told him this. He said, Abraham, your father, rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And he was glad. And I'm going to tell you what. That, a lot of people seem to think that that promise had something to do with Isaac. And it did have something to do with he was going to have a natural son. But that natural son and that entire lineage was preserved for one purpose only. You realize that for for a thousand years, God kept that, that lineage perfect and clean before him. Undiluted. Because who's coming through it? The one that Isaac typified, the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, Paul had already told them, and he told us in the beginning of this chapter, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, knowing, know ye therefore that they which are of faith... The same are the children of God. Who? A Jew by birth? No. They that are of faith, they're the children of God. Children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, now here's the gospel preached to Abraham. In thee shall all nations be blessed. Physical blessing? No. What? Redemption. Forgiveness. Justification. The covenant of the testimony of the will which Abraham believed concerned his seed. Which the last part of the verse tells us wasn't his natural born seed. Natural born sons and daughters, but Christ himself who would come through that lineage of Abraham. 
The promises are made to Abraham, not in all those natural descendants, but in this one seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, it's made to those who are found in him. Found in Christ. So the promise of the covenant of grace was made to Christ himself, and it was made to all those that are found in him as their surety, their substitute, their representative, their redeemer, and their friend. He says at the end of this chapter, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you as have been baptized, not water baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit, been baptized into Christ, what? You put on Christ. Listen to this. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. Then there's the male and the female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ's, listen to this language now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Not promises, to the promise. Let me say this and I'll close. When God reaffirmed that covenant promise to Abraham after, I remember Abraham went up and offered up his son Isaac. And God stayed his hanging. Said the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. He called to him the first time told him go offer your only son. The angel of the Lord. Who's that angel of the Lord? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's who we're talking about. He said, by myself, because an angel can't swear this. <laughs> the angel of the Lord can, the Lord Jesus Christ. By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in thy seed, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now we'll stop right there, and we'll come back and pick up in verse 17 together next week. Let's stand together. Be dismissed. Lord bless you. Keep you through this week. We'll see you next Sunday.